growing up in these like small market towns mm-hmm. where no one else is into this mm-hmm. stuff, it's like, oh, you're into that rapity rap, rap shit yeah. or you know everyone else is into bands and others so no one around me was really taking hip hop mm-hmm. that seriously mm-hmm. the, they listen to hip hop but mainly it was like for the swearing or real gangster stuff yeah. as pure escapism but the idea of you doing it and that not being something to be embarrassed or ashamed of was mm-hmm. kind of a hard pill to swallow 100%. for a lot of people 100% so then it's like we yeah. all lent into being silly and we're like oh I'm I don't mean it. Of course I don't mean it. No, I'm just yeah, yeah. like pretending to be... Just a bit and, of bands. Yeah. And then then you have to sort of ride out those reviews of people who do mean it yeah. and who are very passionate and purist about it. Mm. That's a jarring listen for them as well. They're yeah. like, what are you doing with our culture? You're not... You're That's disrespectful. So you're caught in the middle. So really. you're caught in the middle. And, and really that's about people pleasing, about yeah. trying to sort of... Is, is second guessing yourself, isn't it? It's That's like, an incredible oh, I, analysis. Maybe I should be doing it this way. I should be doing. There's no shoulds. Killer Keller Official dot com. Street Culture TV. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller podcast. We go have some of this, ladies and gentlemen. Killer Keller podcast live and direct, central London or central as you need to be. That's all I need to say these days. It's become more apparent than ever that you're here for one reason only: it's to spread of street culture and word and information. Uh, and if you want more of that word and information, you go to the Television app, free download, iPhone, Android for all your street culture, sports, and then some. How sponsors the mighty GK Nifty Heads have a massive 100,000 play to earn NFTs to give away to the streets. Just hit the link in the description or go to gkniftyheads.com and get ready for Hot Wars Summer 2024. I'm in an ever-changing world of um, the, the, the breadth of hip hop and where it's been, where it's gone. Um, and who is the vessel to bring it to the people. And one man from the UK has been very much part of my radar ever since I was a wee lad, uh, communicating through uh, letters, pen pals, um, with creative ideas, drawings, sketches, raps, bars, everything. Well, this has led on to his multi-talented behaviour going into things such as fanzines, magazines, comics, um, illustrative covers of books, big shout out to Andy Cowan, um, his own record covers and forward onto his lyrical abilities, capabilities, co-production and more. He is a creative starburst. He goes by the name of Kid Acne. Yes. <laughs> What's up? Finally, we got here, my brother. We made it. How we you made feeling? It. I'm good, man. Thank you. Oh, uh, the jump I'm going to just, because, you know, with all that bean spilling, um, which is the theme of the day, uh, <laughs> we have the new album in in the building, Hauntology Codes. Kid Acne, I bet you were wondering whether I was going to say that right. I could see, I could feel the pressure. (laughs) Yeah, well, it's hard to read it downwards, you know what I mean? But when I designed this sleeve, I knew I wanted a grid of lettering and the the coded aspect to it was just going more with the um, hieroglyphic um, Mm. sort of concept, but tying it into graph and, you know, and my own letter style. Yeah, you very much much own. Lex Thank Records, no, no less, brother. Yeah, Lex man, Records. finally. Yeah. Finally. Ain't that something? So who did you uh, produce the record with? So Spectacular Diagnostics in right. Chicago produced the beats. Um, we've done three okay. albums together. Wow. We did one on Lex in 2019 called yeah. Have a Word. The one in the middle with Mike Lewis and uh, Lewis Recordings. We got Mike Lewis all got day. Mike Lewis. Another, another seasoned veteran, yeah, man. legend in the game. Mike's great. Real uh, talk. Uh, and then this one. So back on Lex for this one. So it's my third album on Lex, sixth album in total. Doesn't get boring at all, does it? It's just a creative yeah, man. turn of the wheel. But I took a break for a long time from music. You know, I took a break for almost 10 years from the Romance Ain't Dead album. Yeah. That's 2007. Remember that well. Till 2015, I started the Mongrels Project again. Yeah. yeah. And then that ran for a few years and then 2019 reluctantly yeah. kind of got back into solo MC. Yeah, yeah. Reluctantly, I, I understand that. It's, I, ne- it, I never yeah. wanted to be a solo rapper. I wanted yeah. to be in a group. You know, like, 
in the 90s growing up, like all my favorite hip hop was groups. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Della Soul, Tribe Called Quest, Beasties. Beastie Boys, yeah. Goats. Yeah. Uh, Freestyle Roots. Fellowship. Freestyle Fellowship. Ooh. Yeah. The huge, huge influence. So the idea of being a solo MC wasn't really appealing to yeah. me. But as you know, going back to the Pen Pal era, yeah. there's not many people from where you live. You, you grow up in a small market mm. town. How many rappers do you know? Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So I wasn't really hanging out with MCs. Uh, in Leicester, there was a few. So we we did have a group that was kind of short-lived. But by the time it got what, to... What like, was that called? What called was Mongrels. It was Mongrels. So it was Mongrels. Yeah. The, well, you were... I I get in my mind that at some point you were in a kind of band-esque... That was Toa Dynamic. That's it. So yeah. that wasn't hip-hop. That was Manny, you remember, see? Yeah, yeah. Woo. But the mongrels thing, the whole idea was that there'd be three or four MCs. And we did do that for a while. Mm. But by the time it got to actually making records, there was a few years later, like yeah. everyone had kind of dropped off. So it yeah. was left with me and Benjamin who made the beats. And yeah. then mongrels became me and him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another way. Um, it, as, a, as a piece of production, it takes me back to an era. And I know a lot of our audience will relate to this. Uh, the fat lace, fat boss, the, the 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 influence of you know hard sampling and uh, just you know little head nods to certain pop culture. It's a lot of pop culture references in my yeah. lyrics. Yeah, 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 and the samples too. True. Yeah, yeah, I do throw them in. <laughs> yeah, but that's great. How does that translate to to produce in America? Like, for instance, Uvavu Uranu is like he would never have known that that was from you know a nineties comedy yeah. show. So I've been working with Rob Spectacular Diagnostics since twenty seventeen. Yeah, is when we first started working together, and then that. Took a couple of years till the first album came out yeah. and we've been stockpiling stuff. But he uh, is quite a rare American producer in that he's been into UK hip hop since the late 90s. So we are past crossed um, in the early 2000s through a label called Chocolate Industries. I don't know oh, if you remember that, them. Yeah, of course, yeah. by Seven. Wow. And um, Rob was getting a lot of low life and you know big data and all this sort of stuff yeah. being sent over and no one else over there was that interested but he was like i, I like this mm. so he like mcs on here uh and on you know some of the other collaborations and he's known about those mcs mm. like he knew about cashmere and verb t and he knew Absolutely about jest and blasts i mean there's so many fucking great moments on the album so I he's think. he's kind of open to the sort of British sensibilities, I, mm. I guess. So mm. it wasn't so jarring for him of like, what what are you talking about? What's this? So Rob handles all the production, but mm. uh, as we mentioned before, then I'll I'll sort of step in and help with the arrangement and particularly the dialogue samples mm. is something that I tend to throw in. If I'm, I don't necessarily want a rapid, rappy, rappy hook, mm. but I want something there. Mm. There's things that just come in, to my mind that I think, yeah, I want that vocal yeah. and I'll try and find it, you know. It's a lot of sourcing then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the, and again, you've got to check the album. It's on Spotify, you know, don't sleep. I repeat, do not sleep, my repeat. It's uh, just moments where you'll you'll just add a, scr a zigger in, like, like that, and it's just like, where the fuck did that come from? Yeah. It, it's got a rich, it's a richness that maybe harks, you know, on par with, the production richness of a Kendrick Lamar album where it just f feels like it's got a lot. It's not just, it's not, it's not an easy listen. It's not designed that way. No. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's densely it's packed. Yeah. It's densely packed. But the brief for this one was I wanted it to be 10 tracks. Mm -hmm. So what I might have done over 12 or 14 tracks on the previous albums, I was like, I want to pack that into 10 songs on mm -hmm. this, like half an hour. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that each track's got a specific role what could have been an intro is actually part of the first song. Exactly. You know, there's other bits that could have been interludes, but they're not. They're built mm. into the track. And I just wanted to kind of get from A to B with it as, yeah, tightly packed as possible mm. without outstaying the, my welcome, without overwhelming the listener. Yeah, because but sometimes you can do things... It's peppered to, in the right way, I think. 100%, because sometimes you can do that with the almost like an... <laughs> attention-seeking way to people that have already got your attention. It's almost like yeah. throw them a line that 
completely abstract something and makes them feel like they're, they're, they're not in on the joke sure. or in on the conversation. Or too many Easter eggs, you know what exactly. I mean? It's just like, come on, I'm here. I'm already, yeah, you've yeah, got yeah. my time, yeah, yeah, you've yeah, got yeah, my yeah. money. Like, just I love like, that. ease it's off true. a little bit. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a big learning curve. But in making music this time round, I, I said before, I feel like this is like season two of Kid Acne's solo career. Like Ooh. I made three albums in my 20s, kind of took a break most of my 30s, came back to it. And then now in my 40s, I'm yeah. making this trilogy of albums again. But what's happened in the, in the interim is that I've built life experience, I've yeah. built wisdom, I've actually studied the craft yeah. more. In my 20s, I was putting out records before I even knew what a 16 was I didn't yeah. know how to rhyme on beat yeah, you know yeah, yeah, that yeah. and I get it you know there was reviews at the time where people were like why do I have to listen to this guy's demos you know what I mean like as if I wasn't competent enough to be putting the music out but my view at the time was it was very DIY and that's what it's all about it, you know 100%. warts and all it's out yeah. there punk but yeah a punk sort of attitude I understand that's not an easy listen for a lot of people either but mm. at least now maybe it's not no more of an easy listen, but I've I've perfected my craft more so now that I'm comfortable with it and I think I know what I'm doing. Mm. So it's more deliberate. It's yeah. it's not leaving it to chance. That's exactly it's, it. It's a self study, isn't it? Self study, a bit more kind of calculated, but also leaning into the authenticity. Yeah, you know what I mean, of authentically being me. I think yeah. I lost my way. Like maybe a lot of us did over the years, um, and uh, the pandemic was a good kind of reset, reset yeah. and realign with your values. And then it was like, okay, so if I'm going to make this kind of music, this is the amount of effort I need to put in to make it authentically me. Mm. And I'm, and I think I've done my job because this is the first time I've made an album where people who are holding high regard are contacting me and saying. Mm. I listen to it. I like it. I know? also think there's a there's a level of self assurance and confidence that you know when I see your videos more recently as well. Not that there was in ever any doubt, but it's just almost like you're you're like you say that it's almost like the the two point oh. You know, it's the it's the it's the attitude of I've I've lived this. Do you know what I mean? And I'm here. You know, yeah. Elton John. I'm still standing. Because <laughs> that's the artistry yeah, in the show. Sure. You know? We want to feel like. You know, we hold a fucking candle up um, to our heroes. And it's only once you've gone through a life of music where you realise, wow, they actually, you know, they probably had more obstacles than I did. Yeah. Because, you know, they they were road testing as they were going in the same way. Yeah. But you've now, you're like, you're in your 40s now. And this, this holds true to where you are right now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. Um I feel maybe in the past I was definitely hiding behind the sort of self-deprecation of humour more than I needed to. Um, but I think that was also um, maybe born out of like an insecurity or maybe even an embarrassment of doing it. Because again, it. talking about growing up in these like small market towns mm. where no one else is into this mm. stuff, it's like, oh, you're into that. Rappity rap, rap shit, yeah. or you know, everyone else is into bands and others. So no one around me was really taking hip hop mm -hmm. that seriously. Mm -hmm. The did listen to hip hop, but mainly it was like for the swearing or real gangster stuff yeah. as pure escapism. But the idea of you doing it and that not being something to be embarrassed or ashamed of was mm -hmm. kind of a hard pill to swallow. Hundred percent. So it, then it's like we yeah. all lent into being silly, and we're like, oh, I'm. I don't mean it. Of course I don't mean it. No, I'm just yeah, yeah. like pretending to be. Just a bit of bounce. Yeah. And then then you have to sort of ride out those reviews of people who do mean it yeah. and who are very passionate and purist about it. Mm. That's a jarring listen for them as well. They're yeah. like, what are you doing with our culture? You're not, you're, that's disrespectful. So you're caught in the middle. So you're really. caught in the middle. And, and really that's about people pleasing, about yeah. trying to sort of, is, is second guessing yourself isn't it it's that's like, an incredible oh, I, analysis maybe I should be doing it this way I should be doing there's no shoulds yeah. it's like I, sh I want to do it this way yeah. so I'm going and that's what I've learned over yeah. over time is I'm not going to do it this way because I think I should do mm. and put that pressure on myself no one else is asking me mm. so treat it as a um, just embrace the fact that 
I get to have this experience and do it this way. And mm. Lex is a good example of that. There's no one else, there's no other UK MC on that label. Mm -hmm. So whilst I'm sort of outside of the scene in some respects, that's fine. That mm. suits me fine yeah. because I can't compare myself to other people on the label. Yeah. It's, it's such a broad roster yeah. that I just get to be me. And I mm. could have always done that from the beginning because Tom wanted to put me on Lex 20 years ago. Mm. I sort of fumbled that original deal and what why is that? Well, I'd just set up my own label, which is Invisible Spies, yeah. and I was halfway recording my second album when Tom set up the label and he was like, oh, I'm setting up a label, do you want to be on it? I'm like, Well, I'm doing my own thing. Mm. And what I obviously didn't realise was how big and successful Lex was gonna be, but also how supportive Tom was gonna be. Yeah. So my idea at the time was I do my own album, I give you the next album. That was not a year later. No. That ended up being a few years later. Yeah. In that interim, Rec had kind of lost interest. He was the producer at yeah. the time. Big he, up Rec. Big up Rec. He ticked all the boxes he wanted to do. He had his own career in his own right. My boy Graph Writer too. <gasps> and um, we made a... Uh, we made three albums together, but by the third one, he was like, he just wanted to get back to his artwork. Yeah. So that's one thing. The producer yeah. was not really invested in it. Um, Lex was originally part of Warp. Uh, Tom bought himself out of Warp. He went out on his own. Uh, then he did a joint venture of EMI. I got upstream to EMI. In the meantime, Danger Mouse had blown up. You know, yeah, like yeah, the landscape just, changed. So yeah. that, I didn't know that when I'm like, I'll give you the next album. How complicated that next few years would be then we're on a emi all the samples need to come out you've got yeah. to rebuild the album and it got i felt by the time it saw the light of day it was kind of contrived and the baby had been flushed out uh, yeah it? it was just it was too it was not an enjoyable process but also going back to the second guessing thing i was making stuff i thought i should be making mm. no one was putting that pressure on me other than me mm. and then I was just, the street art thing was blowing up. I was missing opportunities with gallery shows and everything. I was on this, what felt like a sinking ship with major labels going down. Just a lot My of space was everywhere. popping up. Yeah. It was just a wild time. It was yeah. like a wild time. Uh, and then I stopped doing music for a number of years. And now coming back to it fresh and realising that there is no pressure. No. Tom and Lex are like, yeah. they've, been, they've been good for 20 years. You know, yeah. like you can just trust them. That's that's been good for me. You know I find I mean? it. I find stories like that reasonably common. Um, except not a lot of people give themselves the grace to step away for ten years. Like it's mm. almost like they feel like. And I know you mentioned you did. You know this feeling of everything's happening, and I'm missing it. Maybe not in the ten years, but a lot of people don't step away. Like, it's hard, man. Yeah, but it's overwhelming. I'm sure I've had the same when opportunities come. Yeah. They come, yeah, like all at once, like a big wave. Yeah, your season, get on the fucking ride, yeah. And when you're in your early twenties, mid twenties, that's a hard thing to navigate. Yeah, some people are better than others at recognizing a good opportunity, yeah. and or, or maybe got better, healthier boundaries of what to say yes to and what to say no to. Yeah. Me, I was just like, I either say yes to everything, burn myself out, or miss everything because I'm overwhelmed. I like, I didn't, mm. I didn't know how to. Yeah, I didn't know how to navigate that. So it's taken me that. a while to come back round. Mm -hmm. And yeah, okay, a lot of those opportunities have come and gone and that ship sailed. But there's other ones that are still there. And um, and it, I think it's important to recognise that. It's the same mm -hmm. in relationships and friendships. You can be chasing something or someone who mm -hmm. is unavailable. And in the meantime, you're ignoring everyone around you mm -hmm. who is available because mm -hmm. you want that one thing. Mm -hmm. And that's that's madness. That is madness. You, you've got to take a step back and yeah, it's yeah. like, right, what have I got here? Yeah. What can I do now? And, 100%. And at the minute, I'm blessed, you know, I'm working with a good label, good producer, great MCs. That are, they're meaningful collaborations mm. as well. It's not just uh, contacting someone out of the blue. These are friendships and relationships that mm. have developed over 20 well, years Sonny as well. Sonny Jim, Capo, Capo, for sure is within our generation of UK MC. Yeah, yeah. You know, King Cashmere, Don, like... All of them, all three of them. And, like, and I've known them for a long, long time, so... And it's good for me because it sets me... It almost sets me up for a fall if I'm going to put them on... Yeah. <laughs> going to put them on the album. I know Fresh they're going to do a good job. Um, you know. Time. 
creates the brand, doesn't it? And that's probably why you were able to step away the way you did, because, you know, as a currency, time allows you to build on a thing. Um, there is, in my mind anyway, there's only one person that can pull off the art that you do. You Thank know, you. It was street art before street art. It was street art before street art. Without yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. Um, that also lost me a lot of street cred once it became street art, because then, because from my generation, our generation, in the, well, I was going to say mid to late 90s, even in the early 90s, there was a lot of what at the time was called aerosol art and people were being very experimental. I'm yeah. um, thinking about Iconoclast in particular yeah. and the jams that I went to as a teenager yeah. in Birmingham. It was, everything went. You could do yeah. whatever you wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't uh, labelled as street art. No. Part two and there doing was, realism just looked fucking sick. Juice 126 with the yes. drips and the abstract paint, System doing the HR yes. Geiger. Um Chew yeah. with his 3D, just Chew. otherworldly. It was, Big up there Chew. was some, for me, really inspiring stuff. And then alongside that, I was seeing Graph Graph as well. There yeah. was all, but I I enjoyed all of it. Yeah. Um, it wasn't like, oh, it only, it's only this way. Or not no, at all. Or yeah. not at all. Um, but I think for some of the writers and artists that maybe were slightly left leaning or slightly more, they had other riches to scratch than um, painting in a traditional sense. Mm. They didn't know where to take that. Mm. And for me, it was writers that I met in in Paris, actually, mm. that were they were more kind of experimental with mm. application of different materials mm -hmm. or wheat paste or the pictograms and the painting more like icons mm. rather than letters. And there was there kind of was a scene bubbling under of this sort of more like yeah like left field graph but it wasn't called street art then mm. and then when street art came along initially it was these types of writers that maybe just wanted to be a bit more experimental and then it just opened the floodgates of anyone and yeah. i feel where a lot of graph writers took a dislike into street art it was more about the people that just came in out of, uh, out of nowhere with no culture attached to it yeah um i've got a bit of flack over the years myself but i've generally managed to coast through because yeah. people have understood where i've come from and that it's been with good intention and that it's authentic i'm not i'm not a threat to no. anyone you know what i mean i'm just doing my own thing and what what i wanted to do as a teenager was to have my own style. Yeah. Like I say, I met all these different writers, established national, international writers as a teenager, and they all had unique styles. Mm. Same as all your favourite MCs had unique styles. It's, so I was like, I need to find my own style. Yeah. And it also coincided with taking acid and having that sort of epiphany mm. of like, just be you, mm. just be you, just do your thing. So my, my style of graph really comes from my style of drawing as a... Mm. as a kid, mm -hmm. pre-graph of being inspired by my brother's drawings and us just doing comics as mm. as children. That's where these characters come from. And then with a little tweak, being inspired by like She Won or mm. Fire, mm. BFM, um, and then illustrators wow. and comic artists like Pete Fowler. You know, mm -hmm. it was a combination mm -hmm. of these types of things that my style sort of was inspired by. But it serves the that, brand. It you know. serves the brand too. Like, just going back to that, I mentioned, I think what the reason why people uh, receive it so well is because, and there's only a few people that do it. There's only a few people out there that embody all aspects, but you know it's definably them. It's very rare. Mm. I'm trying to think of some now that really, that rap and do that, you know, do their own album covers. There's more... So now, yeah, back sure. then, again, I think that was another reason why I was like hiding behind the humor. I didn't really know how to be an art rapper yeah. because I thought, well, that's even weirder. So then I sort of separated these two things. But in the beginning, I was doing the illustration and I was yeah. printing the sleeves and a lot of art related stuff in the videos. And then for some reason, I just was like, no, they need to be completely separate. Yeah. And I, I did myself a disservice. But last year... Um, I was invited, well, this the visual, Visible Planets mm -hmm. show in Denver last summer. Nice. And the concept was 
MCs who are visual artists, and we did a group show and perform live. And That's that was sick. Co curated by Homeboy Sandman. What? Me, him, Quelly Chris, um, Decker, Aesop Rock had stuff in the show. And it for me, that was like pure validation of like, okay, well, maybe it is all right to be an art rapper mm. and I can paint canvases. The canvases inspired this record sleeve. Fucking we did right. a live show. You know, it's a yeah. baptism of fire to yeah. be on stage with those, that kind of caliber MC. Yeah. And it's like, here's me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Here's my take on hip hop. Yeah. And my take on uh, these sort of visuals. But uh, over there, as you know, it's, it's less apologetic. Mm. People are not arrogant, but they're really sure of themselves and positive. Yeah. And I do well to sort of take a leaf out of their book a bit more and be a bit more kind of, um, yeah, have more confidence in myself, actually. Mm. I think that know. comes with it. I mean, America is, you know, notoriously known for its its play, its fun. You know, gangster rap is a serious, serious fucking thing. But when you build it into the entertainment industry of America and sell it to the people. The people quite, they clearly are receptive, but they don't, they don't often see that, what they're hearing with reality. You know, mm. there's, there's a lot of in uh, conversations with a, an album like Snoop Doggy Style. Yep. For its time, we were listening to it. It's just like, well, that's what Americans do. They, and Americans, you know, would almost like lighten the mood. Like these cartoons that are going mm. off all on that. But, you know, there's a serious level to it, isn't it? Yeah, it's almost like watching an action movie. Yeah. Of like pure escapism. Yeah. Not really seeing that maybe there is a real aspect to that. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, um, and when you, just going back to what you were saying about how the cynicism of, you know, the UK and the way that, particularly outside in the rural areas, you know, perceive things, that that play makes you false because you're... You, and this, speaking of someone that came from the villages, right, you, you're you trying to be something that best doesn't represent you here. Mm. But... And that's where the self-deprecative, you know, kind of tongue-in-cheek yeah. comes into play. And that's what happened when I was doing the Prime and Keller stuff. And, sure. Well, that's it, you know, it's like... Well, how else are we supposed to behave, you know? Because we're never going to be walking around with, you know, AK-47s. Yeah, yeah. We can't take ourselves seriously, so why would we expect yeah. anyone else to? Yeah. But also, that's before the kind of appropriation, the idea of appropriation as well. You yeah. sort of, you, you feel genuinely passionate and drawn to certain sensibilities of, yeah. uh, or creative outlets. Yeah. But then there was a sort of, oh, well, I can't possibly be... Uh, serious about this because like you say i haven't got the credentials but over time you realize well that these are the credentials you know what i mean it's it, and it's all yeah it's i don't know it's an interesting one it takes a long time to find your way but i've said before it's like art and music it's not like being an athlete or a footballer you haven't got a shelf life mm. and there was i mean at art college they always talk about like young genius old master that's fine, you know. Yeah. Some people they they burn bright fast. Yeah, they're gone. Yeah. Other people, it's like a slow burn. It yeah. takes a while. I feel I've had. I love that shit. Aspects of both yeah. in my, you know, my early twenties. I felt like I couldn't put a foot wrong. I was one of the youngest mm. at the time doing it. Yeah. Now I'm one of the oldest. Yeah, yeah. But there's a uh, apart from a few detours and mm. you know knocks along the way. Yeah, okay, I took the scenic route, yeah. but I'm here, I'm still doing it, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. You, you, you know, I've been doing it for, what, 30 yeah, years now? Uh, yeah, just to add value to that, what you just said there, you, your lane, you have, you've got a lane, bro. Like, mm. no one else can take that. Like, when you listen to the out, I mean, everything that we're talking about here is reflectant on what the album holds, because you're... Um, it's in there. It's in it's the lyrics. It's all in there. And yeah, that's yeah. what makes an artist, you know, it's like these experiences that no one from the streets of any city could... You, they, they, it's irreplicable. That's the whole point, right? It's interesting because, well, yeah, like, talk about growing up in these small towns and villages. It was yeah. like the idea of the city 
happy and that's where we're going to meet all these streetwise mm. guys and they're going to like teach her and i remember my experience of going into leicester is the mm. closest city and yeah, yeah. skaters and oh, yeah, yeah. big up it leicester was, crew old tight leicester amazing. Come on. i love leicester i love leicester but um, all day. there was also a sense of like people being a little bit wet around the ears because they it's on the doorstep mm. so there's no sense of adventure to find it yeah um, when you're from a small town, you're traveling a lot. Yeah. So it was like 13, 14, 15, mm. I'm going to different cities. I'm if it's a rave in Derby, you're going to Derby. Uh, yeah. It, I get you. And so ironically, you can end up with a bit more life experience or a mm. bit more streetwise yeah. because you've, you're have you the like the village mouse going into the city. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was a sort of an interesting thing to see as a teenager as well that i thought like the city kids would have all the answers but maybe they didn't you know what no. i mean so there was a uh, listen big up big up all my city folk you know you're um yeah i'm not yeah, not no. not yeah, dissing it or decrying it no, I'm but joking. i'm talking about an, an experience at a they're certain complacent. age there's a complacency because of things in front of them sure you know um, that, that sense of call to adventure yeah of like i need to go and find this yeah. stuff i you know i ended up in some wild yeah, well, you know, I remember being in Manchester as a teenager on mushrooms on Friday the thirteenth, oh. like lost at night on my oh. own. And first, like to the, that... first to the Crep place, then straight to Grand Central. That's my that yeah. was my kind of Manchester stint. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, man, it was <laughs> love that era, London just, Road. Just love traveling in general. Yeah, um, and that was national. Then it went international. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, complacency within uh, cities is one thing. Um, then comes the burgeoning fucking grime scene, which um, adds value. Like we have, for its time anyway, we had the Fat Lace contingency. We had uh, all the hip hop events popping off, you know, Scratch and Deck Effects and Scratch, blah, 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 Kung yeah. Fu. Yeah, all yeah, these yeah. amazing fucking things. And then out of nowhere comes this grime that adds another, you know, colour to the palette. Um, and almost in a w way, turns what was initially UK hip hop into more um, authenticates it in a way because it's people are more willing to accept an English accent through grime. Yes. And then all of a sudden that that filters through to all the other areas in British music. It's like a blessing in the same with the street art helped graph in a lot of ways. And a lot of people don't want to accept that. But mm. what it's made painting in the street easier yeah, since the general public understand that visual language. Yeah. Back in the day, it was really hard just painting in the street. Really You're hard. getting stopped all the while. Yeah. Uh, because no one understands what the end result's meant to be. Yeah. Uh, now they're like, oh, it must be some of that street art stuff yeah. I've seen or heard about. Yeah. And it might not be painting a burner, yeah. but there's more of an acceptance to mm. that and you see it through photographers as well maybe they initially they were interested in street art mm. and then like you know what this is all a bit kind of contrived mm. or samey mm. it's the graph i'm interested in mm. and then they're documenting tags and throw-ups and track size and stuff because that's more exciting to them but mm. their inroad to it mm. was street art and yeah. maybe the same with yeah the the more boom bap or uk hip-hop uh leaning stuff is gaining an audience yeah. like you say through different genres subgenres yeah. because then they're like oh i can i can understand what that, that person's yeah. saying now i'm getting these references do you feel a, a, the creative process is re relatable i think i know the answer to this but if you know standing in front of a blank canvas or page to do a piece or wall or whatever against diving into a studio and you know picking apart a beat you received and embellishing that and then writing then executing is is this one and the same is it what, what's the difference in thought process it's no different um it's just a it's like having a toolkit it's just picking the tool that suits that job better uh, so for yeah. me and again i went off on a tangent for a while in my mm. career but initially and it, I saw it this way and I see it this way now. It's just a different way to present uh, visuals, yeah. to present language. Yeah. So in in a piece, it's the written word and in rap, it's the spoken word. Yeah. Um, there's visuals that 
we talk about these pop culture references, mm. maybe on a rap, I prefer to just say that thing. Yeah. On a piece, they might be the characters within it. It's just, it's, oh, yeah. you're just making a choice of like, I want to present this idea. Yeah. Sometimes it's more powerful in the rap because then someone else is just imagining it in their own way. Mm. And that's great. Yeah. If you, if it's too, um, linear mm. it's like no you have to see it this specific way so i don't know yeah it's just different ways of presenting visuals i have i've tied myself in knots over the years of being, oh it should be where well, you know even outside of hip-hop and graffiti it's like should it be illustration should it be fine art should it be mm. printmaking um what's got what's got the value to what i don't want to go monetary value but like the value for my idea mm. uh and and now i've I am sort of care about that less, or if it's high art, low art, whatever. Mm. It's just disposable, if it lasts forever, I don't care. I'm just, it's about trying to get as many ideas out as possible mm. and picking the format that is most suitable to That's that. That's correct. Yeah. You said something there about the production and how you, sometimes you you say certain words, trigger the, the listener's imagination to mm think in a different way the pop ref cultural reference is one thing verbally but then there's this upfrontness and it kind of goes like you say i think when i think about this i think about score trc right? okay because he'll always have a character but actually the depth is in the letters so it's the same sort of thing it's like sometimes a pop cultural sample actually is just for impact it's like bang there you go like a character would yeah. be, right? That can sometimes, you know, if Mickey Mouse has got his finger up at somebody and on the wall, like, that's fucking sick. You know, the eight-year-old kid would love that. But it's not so obvious when you're doing it on record because you're actually working with um, a different set of dynamics sure. that, that trigger people emotionally in different ways. The nostalgia of a, you know, of a thing popping out from mm. a classic 80s TV program is one thing. But how do you capture at the same time capture their imagination? Yeah. Verbally? Well, music too, because you're hearing it in real time, aren't you? Yeah. And if you miss it, you got to listen to it again. With yeah. a painting, it's static, so you can stand there for as long as possible mm. till you get it. Mm. And I feel with those characters you talk about, if they're, especially if they're recognizable cartoon characters, or even if they're really kind of obscure references, yeah. the character um, draws in the viewer. And then you start studying the lettering. Mm. So it's a sort of, it's almost a bait and switch of like, I'm painting this colourful character, but what I actually want you to do is look at my lettering. Yeah. And it's a good way of drawing in the audience. Honey trap. Think, yeah, exactly. It's, oh, it's smart. I love that shit. Yeah. I love it. Because maybe like some of those writers yeah. you mentioned, like the lettering is so kind of wild to yeah. certain people. It's like, I just want to put something in there that's a hook yeah. to draw people in. Yeah, you know yeah. What I mean? And it's quite hard to do. I mean, Not everyone can do it. Not no. everyone can do both. You know, some people can only paint characters, some people only paint letters. And, and the ones that can, are uh, multifaceted mm. and that can do it all, I think it's, it's another string to their bow and all credit to them. You mm. know what I mean? What keeps you, uh, what keeps you creative? What a tish, let me go more specific. <laughs> what 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 are your influences? Where 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 do you go when you you know when you consider again the blank canvas or the blank mm. or the empty studio? Project? I feel if I'm really being honest to myself, it's it's the outliers of the scene. Like I said, I, said, I don't feel I really ever fitted in mm. as such. But the people I was drawn to were on the periphery of it. Mm. Um, maybe they're more celebrated now, but stylistically they were doing things on the verge. So I've talked about it before, but Futura, yeah. that was the Mo Wax era. Yeah. So Mo Wax was on the sort of outside of hip hop. Yeah. The music was different. The packaging was really different. Banging, yeah. But his, what he brought to that really kind of like opened my eyes to mm. what was possible. Like, mm. wow, this is, you know, there was characters... There were symbols. There was abstract mm. marks. It was mm. just like this is this is wild Thanks, shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that was a big influence. Pete Fowler, I talked about before, mm -hmm. who did Slouch Comics, mm -hmm. and he went on to do the Super Furry Animals artwork. Okay, stylistically, big up, big up Super Furry Animals as well. Okay. Stylistically, he had a big influence on me. Yeah. I have to say, Gasface. Um, yes, hundred percent. 
Yeah. Um, Great era defining like art. And again, he's someone that managed to pull in this, yeah. and still now is like marries art and commerce yeah. together in a authentic way. Yeah. Um, she won. Yeah. A big influence. Yeah. Uh, Fuck his stoppist, all them guys. All those guys, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, that whole era. Madness, yeah. Yeah, so it's Katie Brown and Jason yeah. and, yeah. you know, Rex whole crew. Mm. Um, I don't know. And then mixed Musically, in with, yeah. like, pop art references, Richard Hamilton mm. and, and Warhol and this sort of stuff I was seeing at school. Mm. And then skateboard graphics. Skateboard through, like, graphics, Date, yeah. Deathbox, yeah. Insane. Um New Deal was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Andy H bomb, Howell, I think he was. I also, you know, I, also I, I should hail up as well. Bizarre Rides to the Far Side album cover. Yes, game changing. Yeah, yeah. A, a skate brand endorsing the artwork, uh, and it just f- it fucking fitted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had that um, connector with the Hex and Slick Battle yeah. from LA around yeah, yeah, similar yeah. sort of time. Yes, yes. Uh, but yeah, yeah, a lot of things like characters, the mm. Far Side logo or that Alcoholics logo mm. or the Funk Dubious yes. record sleeve, all those oh, sorts of things. Oh my God, the Funk Dubious, which do you be? Mm. Incredible album cover. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. So that, they were the things that kind of inspired mm. me in this style. Mm. Uh, and what keeps me creative is... More just wanted to kind of push, you know, in many ways, nothing's changed since back then. Mm. But if I look at my drawings now compared to even a couple of years ago, the proportions are getting better. The the line's more confident. Mm. There's more intention to it. Mm. So it's took me, yeah, like 30 years to do something that looks like it took me five minutes, but it's deceptively simple. A lot, a lot of work goes into it. Yeah. A lot of work goes into it. Um, and I think it's just that sort of striving for perfection, but also letting things go. You know what I mean? It's like that. I've, I've said this before. It's like between getting it right and getting it done. Mm. Because while you're working on it, you can't, you don't need to stand behind it. You're not accountable. Mm. Once you let go of it, you're mm. open to criticism. So mm. there's a there's a comfort in constantly tweaking and refining something. Mm-hmm. But... I love the immediacy of just getting stuff out. And that, yeah. that's one thing I enjoyed about doing the wheat pace, actually, was mm-hmm. just like doing these kind of raw drawings, blowing them up, screen mm-hmm. printing them, pasting them up everywhere. And off it goes, yeah. And then they're just out there. Yeah. And some last, some don't. But it was an enjoyable pro, And it was about occupying space as well at the bottom of the doors that other people mm-hmm. weren't using. Mm-hmm. And while other people were shouting, you know, their statement really big, bold, yeah. and loud. I was just sort of like tucked away, sort of quietly whispering. Yeah, it's like, that. oh, I'm down here. You yeah, know what I mean? Amount of cleaners that can't be bothered to bend over and clean something off, you know, put everything low. Yeah, that's <laughs> Always it. Go or low. Just, just using what's available to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Resourceful. Like, that's what the streets are about, isn't it? Mm. You know, being resourceful, um, working with what you got. Um, with what? simplicity. I mean, look, there's nothing simple. You know, turning a tap on isn't just a simple thing. It's like fucking, it takes ages to make that water work. And when you see something like this, even the details and, you know, what, yeah, so how far is too far in that yellow? What, you know, yeah, but that's on purpose because I want yeah, it to it. be like the off, off register kind of comic art that Warner inspired Brothers me and, kind and of screen prints and... Chuck Jones kind of shit. Yeah, so it's like, even though that's not, Printed that way, stylistically, I wanted to look like that. It fucking bangs. You know what I mean? It fucking bangs. I love it. I love it. And also, um, I learned through drawing in my sketchbook religiously, day in, day out, like for years and years and years, that actually they they could be the finished piece. Mm. And what I used to do was draw in my sketchbook and then I draw it properly Mm. after. And you're stripping out all that rawness, all that kind of energy. Energy. So now I try and keep that energy and that rawness in the end result. I might draw it multiple times, mm. so I'm getting the muscle memory right and I'm getting the exact letter or character how I want it. I might even make a composition mm. in Photoshop, just piecing bits together, but I want it to have that rawness and that energy. And <sighs> Quentin Blake, that's another influence. Quentin Blake? From the Roald Dahl books, uh, you know, as oh, a kid. Oh, yeah. Just loose, so loose. And that looseness is what, listen, that, that's the thing. I mean, big up everyone using their sketchbooks and doing what they do from a graph point of view because I, I, I'm a firm believer of, you know, of that, that culture can't go. But I agree with you that 
once you commit, there's no doing the energy will you know it'll go. So mm. you got. I don't know where people like that. The, the aforementioned what's his name? Quentin Blake. Where does he get that level of energy from? It's just. I mean, I get the tools. I understand the tools in which he uses, but they, there's just something about that. Yeah, but I saw an exhibition of his at Somerset House, and he made these compositions yeah. as well. So, um, as a kid, seeing those books um, in the library, yeah. you just thought, "Oh, it's a perfect drawing." But you know, maybe there's three not as perfect drawings fitted together. Ooh. But it's the same as you know, vocal takes. Not everyone gets it all in one yeah, go. Yeah, you yeah. can chop and cut and paste. Yeah. That's fine. And understanding that that's not cheating, you're right. getting the desired effect yeah. using the tools available to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Anima- same with cutbacks, you know what I mean? That's frowned upon. Yeah, and but- animation as well. Animation's the same thing. It's like, you know, you, you're, you're working on with different, um, what are they called? Cells, mm-hmm. you know? And sometimes I, I, the imperfections, again, that's what makes it great. But, you know, nothing is, you know, all said and done, one take or, yeah. you know, there's, a, there's so many... Variables. It's hard though, isn't it? Because you've got to see stuff in real life. And I think yeah. about that Saatchi show last year. Yeah. I saw you. Yeah. Um, we're so used to seeing these paintings on JPEGs yeah. on social media. Yeah. They look perfect. Yeah. And I thought this when I first saw Pop Art and Warhol stuff. It's perfect. Yeah. You see it in real. Mm. It's fingerprints, footprints, pencil marks, yeah. you know, things are outside the line. And that's fine. Yeah. That's actually good. What rather than having that, oh, well, anyone could do that, it's like, no. That person did it, you didn't. Yeah. But what is more in, inspiring of like, oh, and it doesn't need to be perfect and it's still valid. It's it's um, it's a relevant piece of work, but it's not as perfect as what you think it is. And and to sort of, I love that rawness in yeah. other people's work, but applying it to myself is a real battle. You know, like I have to force myself to let mm. certain things go. Yeah, that it's actually the way it's meant to be. Yeah. I think the I think the um, iconic pictures of the day. It's almost it precedes the actual picture itself, the processes of the picture, what is behind the curtain of of any mm. one visual. Um, Mona Lisa, I suppose, if you get close enough to that, you'll see a ton of imperfections. But that's why it costs so much mm. because you're so used to seeing it. And I guess it's the more you see something. The more you see something. There's a value in that too, yeah. though, isn't there? Of just over um saturating people with the same image and, yeah. and that installs value as well. Yeah. Coca-Cola. Either repetition or scale, but <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you know, then you go into branding and logos and, and such, but uh, you know, it all stems from somewhere. Yeah. So the future is <clears throat> the future is this new album. Ontology codes. So uh, available now, Lex. Um, yep. What else is going on for the future, my brother? What else is happening? Well, just talking about that, like um, lockdown being a reset. Mm. I feel like I'm. I know that's a few years ago now, but I'm still just working on that in terms of not going back to what I was doing pre-lockdown, mm. which was just working myself ragged and getting burnt out and doing things more, that... More, more. Yeah. Yeah, just more, 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 but not <laughs> things that really align with me yeah. anymore. I've, yeah. And I feel, aside from figuring out how to make a, a living as a as an artist, as a Congrats, as MC, which is fucking amazing. It's hard, yeah. it's, it's tough. Oh, yeah. But there's things that I just know I don't want to do anymore. Mm-hmm. So from the outside looking in, it probably looks no different, but for me... I'm just trying to realign myself in terms of producing the work that I want to make. A new compass. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I feel like I got bumped off my trajectory mm. slightly. Mm-hmm. I sort of found my way back and mm. I'm determined to stay here. So in terms of b- big projects coming up, nothing to really speak of. This is of. the project. This is the project yeah. right now. Uh, well, mind you, I'm already on the next... got two more... In the yeah, works, you can't so take, you, can't, um, you can't leave it alone. Uh, and then, yeah, releasing prints, doing all the things I normally do, but um, really just trying to stick to my guns a mm. lot more than than I have done. Mm. Yeah, in recent times, there is before signing off. There is one thing that you, me, and Jest got into a uh, long, long time ago. We're talking like ninety 
five. I think it probably was, yeah. Oh, you know, a long yeah. time ago. And it was just me just being a dickhead, uh, doing these freestyle uh, uh, projects. And uh, I just used to get a kick out of sending people empty spaces on a, a tape inlay card, say, fill it. But this one particular one, I'd done my first... It's like Exquisite Corpse, isn't it? Where yes. you started and then yeah. the next person to the next Exactly. Thing. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't realise, we didn't realise, it was like, I'm going to send this to Kid Hackney. And then and then he came back to me and he goes, oh, you should send that to Jest. So we we're all in cahoots anyway on Pen Pal. So yeah. I sent it to Jest. And you found it. You found yeah, yeah. one of the found it. photocopy, I mean, it's look, looked pretty well rendered compared to what, where I could even imagine where the original's gone, but it was so awesome to see it. Yeah. All three of us. Time capsule. Time capsule of the 90s. Yeah, man. Jess was dope as well. Killed it. Yeah. His flow, he's a great, he's another one from our ilk, our way of thinking, mm. that can apply graffiti art, street art, street art with vocals, with production. Mm. You know, it's just... I'd love to see more of his visual work. Yeah. Um, crazy right yeah it's oh. good i love those artists that are like 360 that do that the visuals on the and the audio capo as well he started again uh, yeah painting juggernauts another one yeah. there's, there's tons of them yeah tons and tons of them more are out there that's the that's yeah. the motto i think more the more the more people em, embrace the whole 360 creative out the be- i mean it's such a head fuck isn't it You're going from one it's a head fuck like, because <laughs> i i struggle doing my own artwork is Agonizing. Yeah. If I'm doing that for someone else, it's easy. I find it so much yeah. easier. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It, but what I've also done is, in my view, designed some great album sleeves for other people, mm. not so great ones for myself. So <laughs> because I like phone it in or just not mm. really care about my own output. Mm. Um, now, that's another thing. I'm like, this one I was like, I want to spend as much time on this as I do for someone else. Mm. So um, that's another realignment. Well, we, we need to get that. Tape sleeve, that tape inlay card. I'll send you that. That's that one. I'm going to send it through. You've got to see it. It's going to be all over the socials. It was just such a... It's so funny to see it again and being like... Yeah. Yeah, it's like nearly 30 years ago. Yeah. (gasps) But I can remember the the pen strokes and how important certain pen strokes were. Yeah, yeah. now, bruv, like... It was a good time, though, wasn't it? Because you just... Me, I was just sat drawing listening to music, swapping photos and yeah. fanzines with people. And yeah. it's like, it's an informative time. And yeah. so we're going to be ordering records direct off Blade and 691 Influential. Yeah. The Rough. Yeah, all that guys. stuff. Pick up The Rough. We don't, there's another guy, Manchester, right? Mm. Wow. Um, look, fucking pleasure. My brother. Thank Long you. Time. Yeah, Come yeah, on. that's amazing. Thank you so <laughs> much. In the building. Uh, well, look, you know what it is. Killer Killer Podcast. Out of, it was out of fashion. Another day, another podcast. You know, we've got tons more for you to invest a bit of time in. Enjoying that. Uh, and yeah, sharing is caring. Uh, crime don't pay. Neither do they. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Don't talk to anyone. I wouldn't. You stay lucky, people. Peace. Oh, thanks, man. That was sick. That was cool.